Okay, so why don't we start? Okay. Mr. Lynch will give the last honors talk on representations of a generalized symmetric group. All right, so good afternoon. I appreciate you coming out. My name is Jordan Lynch, and my honors advisor is Professor Moen. Uh, the title of my project is Representations of a Generalized Symmetric Group. So to get started, uh, just give a basic definition of what a group actually is. So a group is a set of elements with a binary operation like addition or multiplication that acts on that set uh, with the full properties of closure, associativity, uh, possession of an identity element, and the possession of uh, inverse elements. So the best way to think about this is actually the symmetries of a square, or not really the best way, but one way to think about this is the symmetries of a square with rotations and reflections. So when we think about uh, D4, let me see. Yeah. So when you think about the symmetries of a square, you have rotations and reflections. And in our case, we consider rotations clockwise 90 degrees, which will we denote by rho. And we consider reflections uh, of that square through that verse, for the, through these vertices in particular, and we denote that as tau. So obviously, if you rotate the square four times, you're going to get the identity element. And if you were to take a reflection and uh, apply it twice, you'll get the same square again. So that's where you get the identity elements. Rho to the fourth tau squared is the identity element. You also get this peculiar uh, relationship that rho tau is tau rho inverse, or rho tau is tau rho cubed. So again, apply the rotation and then reflection, or the reflection in three rotations, you'll get the same thing. So since the project is about group representations, what exactly is a group representation? We actually think about it in terms of it being a matrix representation. So it's a matrix, a matrix representation of a group G, which is a homomorphism. And so essentially what you're doing is you're taking elements of your group and you're applying, you're giving, you're assigning really matrices to those different elements. So again, go back to the example of symmetries of a square where we have rho and tau take the matrix representation. So we can say the matrix representation of uh, rho, that's going to be your matrix representation. So if you were to take uh, the unit vector 1, 0, and you were going to rotate it, you're just going to get 0, negative 1. And if you were to reflect it about that line, you'd get 0, 1 if you apply that transformation matrix, essentially. So the other part of having a matrix representation is that you have to start to consider characters and irreducibility with those characters. So character is simply the trace of the matrix representation. So rho was 0, 1. The, the matrix representation for rho was 0, 1, negative 1, 0. So the character of that is 0. Uh, same thing can be said for the reflection. And the way that you start to think about irreducibility with this is you start to consider inner products on characters. So the definition of an inner product is right there. And the associated theorem with that definition of the inner product is that if you were to take a character of a matrix representation, and take the inner product with itself, you'll get one. Uh, real quickly, I just want to talk a little bit about induced representations. Uh, this comes into play when you start to take, take it to the two-dimensional space. But essentially, what we've done, like when you take the, matri the matrix representation that I showed of rho and tau, those are actually the, two the induced representations. So you have, it's a two-dimensional representation. You can do it formally with this. but I mean, doing it geometrically makes a little bit more sense and it's easier to see. In this case, H is a subgroup, uh, and T is the T1s are your transversals. Uh, the next group we started to look at besides the dihedral groups were the symmetric group. Uh, in this, so it's a group whose elements are permutations of n symbols, so 1, 2, 3, 4, up to n. Uh, the simplest case that we worked with was S4. So with S4, we started to get into the idea of conjugacy classes, and the way we decided those conjugacy classes were finding all the elements that were conjugates. So a conjugate can be defined as any element, G and H, are conjugates if you have a relationship that G is K, H, K inverse, where K is in the group G. So with the symmetric group, it actually worked out really nicely in that the elements in each conjugacy class were organized by their cycle structures. So uh, all of the ones with two elements were in the second conjugacy class, three, four, and so on. Uh, and what you end up getting when you start looking at the representations of S4 are these conjugacy class, or, or these characters, excuse me, this character table here. And the way we originally started looking at it were with tableaus and tabloids and all the polytabloids and all this other stuff that really just got a little complicated. 
and but there are combinatorial methods like the Murray Ham Nakayama rule where you can actually use uh, pictures to kind of make it simpler and find this, this character table. So up to this point, everything has been stuff that we have worked on in the fall, and this is actually the stuff we worked on in the spring. So a little background. Uh, the first time uh, this kind of stuff was looked at was with Shintani in 1976. He was looking at GLN of E and GLN of F, uh, where, the finite, where he had a finite field extension U over F. And then Langland worked, at, worked on it four years later on an analogous problem with GL2, where the, where the field extension was infinite. Uh, and actually played uh, a small role in the Fermat, proof of Fermat's last theorem. Actually, a large role. A large role. <laughs> and his name is Langlands. Right. Langlands? Okay, yes. sorry. Um, so, a little background information. So, the way it was was uh, we started off with two fields. We started off with um, E and F. So, E was a, fi it was a finite field extension over F, where F was some field F sub Q. And this was f sub q to the n. So the degree of our field extension was n. And uh, we defined the Galois, the Galois group of v over f acting on e, where each element sigma in that Galois group would act on the individual elements of uh, e and f. So when you see the g sub i, j, those are just the elements of those matrices that you see in g sub f. So g sub f is defined like that. So X and Y are in the multiplicative group of the F. Uh, G sub E is defined the same way, except X and Y would be in the multiplicative group of E. So how do we do it? So we first start off by constructing all of the one-dimensional representations of G sub F. Are there any comment here? Yes. And, and what's going to follow is, it's, sigma is a fixed generator of the Galois group. Yes, sir. It's not an arbitrary. Yes, sir. Right, sir. Just for, for people. Yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah, okay. That's the Virginia automorphism. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we first constructed all the one-dimensional representations of G sub F, and then we went and constructed all the one-dimensional representations for G sub E, and we counted each one of these. Uh, at first, it seemed like there was a discrepancy because if you look at the number here and we'll look at the number for G sub F, and we're trying to show that there's a one more correspondence. And when we actually looked at the number of one-dimensional representations that were fixed by sigma of G sub E, it turns out that you get the same number as in G sub F. So regardless of the field extension, uh, or the degree of the field extension, or Q, you find that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between all the one-dimensional representations. Uh, however, once we start to look at the two-dimensional case, we got a little bit of a different story. So, what we started by doing was constructing all the two-dimensional ones for G sub F. Uh, you define this group D sub F, which is actually just G sub F, uh, just half of it really, because G sub F was that group with x0, 0, 0, y, and 0, x, y, 0. But now you're defining D sub F to be x0, 0, 0, y such that x and y are in f cross. So that's what d sub f is here. So it's a feeling group, and uh, we induced all of those representations from up to g sub f, and we ended up getting uh, what we call r sub i j. So those are actually all of the inequivalent, irreducible, rep two-dimensional representations of g sub f. Uh, and obviously counted them again. Uh, do the same construction for G sub E, and again you see that there's a discrepancy between the number of those equivalent irreducible representations of G sub E and G sub F. Once we did, once we did that, we came to this equation right here uh, when we started to look at the sigma fixed representations, and those were at, that that formula was actually crucial in finding all of the irreducible equivalent and sigma fixed ones. Turns out that when you take this equation and you start looking at all the possible values for i and j, you find that when n is even, sorry, when n is even, you actually find more representations than you need. So there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence in those two-dimensional representations. But if n is odd, you find that there is a one-to-one -one, one -one correspondence. So if you have an odd field extension, then all of the sigma fixed representations, one-dimensional and two-dimensional, have a correspondence to one of the correspondence to all of our representations of G sub F.
and is even. We didn't count all of them. Uh, we only needed to show that there was one more to show that there wasn't one more correspondence. Uh, but for future work, uh, you could actually consider the cases where n is even, find all of those sigma fixed ones, and count them and see what that number would be. It would be interesting to find. Uh, the other thing is, since we were considering only uh, matrices where you had x, 0, 0, y, so you had a 2 by 2 matrix, you can si could consider values for uh, S3, so S3, S4, looking at 3 by 3 matrices and 4 by 4 matrices, and it gets significantly more complicated as you increase the size of those matrices, but uh, that's it. Any questions?